I wake up the next day, greet my summons and say, thank you for keeping me safe. I turn my attention to the unnamed summon and say, I'm going to call you Jaylee. And with that, I go through my morning routine and then stride out into the Obsidian Covenant to find Vespa or the Covenant Council member. The Obsidian Covenant is an organization built on the principle of power, and with your recent successes, you've garnered quite a bit of attention. Your reputation within the Covenant is growing, but so is the scrutiny. Not everyone appreciates an ambitious upstart. As you walk through the halls of the Obsidian Covenant trying to find Vesper or the Covenant Council member, you come across an enchanter's store with displays of enchanted items, a training room with a knight fighting a sorcerer, and a large mess hall. Eventually, you find yourself in the Grand Hall of the Obsidian Covenant. The tall obsidian pillars that rise to the vaulted ceiling seem to gleam with a deep, foreboding sheen. Before you stands Vesper, her eyes as sharp as ever, but her demeanor is less hostile now. Henry, you've done well, but you must understand that your power attracts both allies and enemies. The Council has another task for you. From the shadows, the council member approaches, cloaked in deep midnight blue robes, his face obscured by the hood. He carries a scroll, which he hands to you. There's a temple hidden deep within the Swamp of Despair. Inside lies an ancient artifact known as the Heart of the Abyss. Fetch it for us, and you shall be further rewarded. Be wary. The swamps are treacherous, and there are whispers of a guardian that protects the temple. And remember, not everyone in the Covenant wants to see you succeed. I open the scroll that I got handed to see what it is. You unfurl the scroll carefully, revealing an intricately detailed map of the Swamp of Despair. The map showcases various pathways through the swamp, marked with symbols that you surmise represent potential dangers or points of interest. Some symbols are familiar, like those for quicksand or nests of venomous snakes. Others are cryptic, their meanings hidden to you. At the heart of the swamp, there's a drawing of a temple. Surrounding the temple are various symbols you can't decipher, but they seem to suggest it's heavily guarded. Also inscribed on the scroll, in a script that seems almost alive as it shimmers under the torchlight, are the words, to the one who seeks the heart, be warned, the abyss watches and waits. The path is perilous, and not all is as it seems. As you finish reading, the shimmering script fades away, leaving just the map behind. I would like to turn to Vespa and say, Sir, I know what some of these symbols mean, but what are these ones? And I then point to all the symbols that I don't know. Vesper steps closer, her gaze fixed on the symbols you're pointing to. She studies them for a moment, before replying. The Swamp of Despair is named so for a reason. Each of these symbols represents a unique danger. She starts, pointing to each in turn. This one she says, indicating a swirling mist-like symbol, represents the mists of forgetfulness. Those who wander into them often find their memories fading, making navigation a nightmare. Pointing to a symbol resembling a cluster of eyes, she continues, The eyes of the abyss. They're not creatures, but magical sensors that alert the guardian of intruders. Avoiding them would be wise. This one, she says, tracing a symbol that looks like a twisted tree with dangling roots, is the hangman's tree. Carnivorous and deceptive, its roots can snatch unsuspecting travelers and pull them underground. Lastly, she hovers over an emblem that looks like a ripple in the water. Quicksands are common in the swamp, but this represents something far more treacherous. It's the abyssal mire. Anything or anyone that falls into it is said to be consumed, never to return. Vesper then pulls back and meets your eyes. The swamps are riddled with both natural and magical hazards. Equip yourself adequately and trust your instincts. Oh, great. So it's a place trying to kill everyone in super creative ways that have no way of just cheating my way around. Well... What equipment do you have that might help? I am new after all, and I don't really know everything that's available other than my private room, which was actually much more comfortable than I expected from an evil organization like this one. Vesper smirks slightly at your comment about the accommodations. We may be an organization focused on power and dark machinations, but that doesn't mean we can't appreciate a bit of comfort. As for equipment... She leads you to a side chamber, revealing an armory filled with weapons, artifacts, and magical items, all displayed on obsidian pedestals. The elixir of true sight. This potion will allow you to see through illusions and detect hidden threats. It lasts for an hour. Boots of the Marsh Walker. These will let you move through the swamp without getting stuck, and they offer some protection against the Abyssal Mire. Staff of Echoes. This can be used to send out a sonic pulse. It won't harm anything, but it can help map out an area or locate the eyes of the Abyss. Cloak of Obscurement. Wearing this makes you harder to detect. Useful if you wish to avoid attention. Talisman of Memory. If you find yourself lost within the mists of forgetfulness, this talisman can help anchor your memories, though its effects are limited. Vesper crosses her arms. Choose wisely, you can take up to three items with you. And remember, while these items can assist, your wit and skills will be your greatest allies. Which items, if any, would you like to take? I already have the map to roughly know where the threats are, and one of my amulets lets me blend with shadows, so the elixir and the cloak won't be super helpful. Uh, so I would like to take the boots, the staff, and the talisman. And with that done, I turn to Vesper and ask, so, what does this Heart of the Abyss do? Please tell me it does something cool and isn't just a mysterious object vaguely talked about in ancient scrolls. Vesper chuckles at your candidness. I admire your straightforwardness. 
The Heart of the Abyss isn't just another obscure relic shrouded in ancient lore. Its power is transformative. The Heart of the Abyss is said to hold the essence of pure, unbridled darkness. Its wielder can command shadows, bend them to their will far more potently than any spell or artifact known. In the wrong, or right hands one could create entire armies of shadows, shroud cities in perpetual night, or drain the very essence of life with but a touch. Her gaze grows intense. But, like all potent artifacts, it comes with a price. The heart is sentient in its own way and craves dominance. Many have tried to harness its power, only to be consumed by it, their souls lost to the abyss. The council believes that with your growing mastery and unique abilities, especially after obtaining the amulet of shadow binding, you might be one of the few who can control the heart. Or, at the very least, you can retrieve it and bring it back safely. After all, it's not just its power the council is interested in, it's the leverage and influence that come with possessing such a relic. So, if I can control it, I can keep it. Or is this another test of my dedication to the Covenant? Vesper's lips curl into a knowing smile, revealing a hint of mischief. Everything in the Obsidian Covenant is a test. But yes, if you can truly control the heart of the Abyss, it would be a waste to let it sit idly in some vault. Its power, combined with your existing abilities, would make you one of the most formidable members of the Covenant. She leans in slightly, her voice lowering. However, the Council is not without its internal politics and agendas. While some genuinely want to see members like you rise and harness such power for the Covenant's greater goals, others might see it as a threat to their own standing. Straightening up, she adds, Retrieve it, show control, and it could be yours to wield. But always be wary of the ambitions of others. With Vesper's words echoing in your mind, are you ready to embark on your journey to the Swamp of Despair? Yeah, I'm ready to head out. I make my way back into the main chamber and say to the Council member, Alright my man, I'm off to get unfathomable power. You stay here and continue being mysterious. I then go to high-five him. Does he high-five me or does he ignore my hand and make me walk off? The council member, shrouded in his midnight blue robes, initially appears to ignore your gesture. His posture remains stoic, the depths of his hood obscuring any hint of emotion. However, after a brief suspense-filled moment, he slowly raises his gloved hand and completes the high-five, albeit with a restrained and calculated motion, his voice, cold and deep, resonates in the chamber. May the abyss guide you, Henry. With a surprising acknowledgement from the council member and Vesper's faintly amused expression in the background, you feel a mix of gratification and unease. With that, you set forth towards the Swamp of Despair. As you approach the edge of the swamp, the landscape changes dramatically. The ground becomes wetter and muddier, and thick mists start to roll in, obscuring your vision. The sounds of distant creatures echo, creating an eerie symphony. The map you were provided with will be essential in navigating through this treacherous terrain. Would you like to head straight into the swamp? Use the Staff of Echoes to get a sense of the surroundings, or take another approach? I would like to use the Staff to check my surroundings and compare the results with the map to see if the map is accurate. I grasp my wood firmly in both hands and flail it wildly until it activates. Grasping the Staff of Echoes firmly in your hand, you focus your energy and channel it into the crystal affixed to its top. The Staff emits a low hum before releasing a powerful sonic pulse that radiates outward, resonating with everything in its path. As the pulse travels, you begin to get fleeting mental images and sensations of the landscape ahead. There are patches of shifting grounds, likely the abyssal mire that Vesper warned you about. Clusters of trees with long, dangling roots, possibly the hangman's trees, sway gently in the distance. Several spots seem to be emanating a faint glow, potentially the eyes of the abyss. The dense mists seem to be shifting and moving with intent, indicating the presence of the mists of forgetfulness. Comparing these insights with the map, you find a few discrepancies. While the major landmarks seem to be in place, some of the dangers appear to have shifted or multiplied, it's possible that the swamp itself is ever-changing, or that the map might be outdated in certain aspects. Armed with this knowledge, how would you like to proceed? I would first like to update the map with the new information that I gathered, then I would like to roll an insight check on the trees to see if they are flammable or not. I got a 7 with my check. As you carefully mark the discrepancies on the map with the new information, you then turn your attention to the trees. Trying to gauge their flammability, you scrutinize the trees, noting their moisture-laden bark and the dampness that seems to cling to everything in the swamp. With a roll of seven on your insight check, you surmise that the swamp's environment likely makes most of its vegetation resistant to burning easily. The constant moisture and dampness would hinder any straightforward attempts to set the trees aflame. However, you're not entirely sure if the hangman's trees possess any unique properties that might make them more or less susceptible to fire. Ah! Where is my objective in relation to all the dangers, and am I able to see a path that lets me avoid most, if not all, of the dangers? Uh, I got a 16 on my perception check. The objective, the temple at the heart of the swamp, appears to be surrounded by several dangers. However, your map and the insights from the Staff of Echoes give you a good sense of where these hazards are located. With a sharp perception roll of 16, you scrutinize the landscape, the map, and the information you've gathered. You note a cluster of hangman's trees sits directly west of your current location. Their stillness is deceptive, and you know better than to approach them directly. The abyssal mire, with its treacherous sinking grounds, spreads predominantly to the east. There seems to be patches of solid ground, but they're scattered and may require careful navigation. 
The mists of forgetfulness appear to be swirling in the north and the south, hemming you in from both directions. The faint glow of the eyes of the abyss can be seen further ahead, seemingly scattered throughout, acting as sentries. You discern a meandering path that seems to lead directly north, skirting the edge of the mists of forgetfulness, and then curving to the west, bypassing most of the immediate dangers. While this path appears clearer of threats than other routes, the swamp is unpredictable, and there's no guarantee of safety. However, with your boots of the Marshwalker and the Talisman of Memory at the ready, this seems like the most promising direction. Would you like to take this path or consider an alternative approach? I would like to take this path, but before setting off, I ensure that the boots are on firmly, the talisman is safe, and I unsummon Simon and Jaylee and use the Amulet of Shadow Binding to blend with the shadows to allow me to sneak more easily uh, in case the eyes of the abyss look in this direction. Ensuring your preparations are thorough, you tighten the boots of the Marshwalker, feeling the slight squish of the swampy substance on their surface. The talisman of memory is securely fastened around your neck, the reassuring weight a reminder of its purpose. With a thought, you release Simon and Jaylee, letting them dissipate back into the Shadow Realm from whence they came, ensuring they won't draw unwanted attention. Finally, you touch the Amulet of Shadow Binding. As you do, darkness envelops you, seamlessly blending you with the shadows around. The world takes on a monochromatic hue, with only the faintest glimmers of light visible. You move with increased stealth, the darkness acting as an additional cloak against prying eyes. As you advance along the chosen path, your steps make almost no sound. The swamp seems eerily silent, save for the distant, muted calls of unseen creatures. Every so often the faint glow of the eyes of the abyss pierces through the mists, but thanks to your shadowy concealment, they seem to pass over you without detecting your presence. After a while the temple begins to loom in the distance, its ancient, moss-covered stones standing in stark contrast to the surrounding mire. Would you like to continue straight towards the temple, or take a moment to survey the area, or make further preparations? I would like to use the staff again to make sure that there aren't any unseen dangers. Time to handle my wood for safety. Focusing once more on the Staff of Echoes, you channel your energy into it. The staff hums vibrantly, and releases another powerful sonic pulse. As the pulse radiates outwards, you are met with a variety of sensations and images. Near the entrance of the temple, you sense movement. Several humanoid shapes lurk in the shadows, seemingly waiting or guarding something. Their exact intentions or affiliations are unclear. Within the temple, there are more echoes of movement, but they're faint, suggesting they are deeper inside or shielded by the temple's ancient walls. Around the perimeter of the temple, there are few patches of ground that give off a strange resonance, likely more of the abyssal mire or some other trap. To the side of the temple, there's an area where the sonic pulse seems to be absorbed or dampened. This could indicate a barrier or protective spell of some sort. Armed with this information, how would you like to approach the temple and its potential dangers? Hmm. Well, none of those are great options. Uh, but I would like to try and stealth my way up to the entrance with the intention of sneaking in like a rogue. Uh, I rolled a three on my stealth check and that was with the advantage thanks to the Amulet of Shadow Binding. With your intent set on sneaking up to the temple, you attempt to use the shadows to your advantage. The Amulet of Shadow Binding gives you a heightened sense of stealth, allowing you to move with great care. However, as you inch closer to the entrance, a misstep causes a loose stone to shift beneath your foot, sending it clattering against another rock. The noise, though subtle, cuts through the eerie silence of the swamp. Instantly, the humanoid figures near the entrance stiffen, their attention drawn towards the sound. One of them, a hooded figure with sharp elven features, steps forward, peering intently into the shadows. Who's there? The figure demands, hand resting on the hilt of a dagger. While you're still shrouded by the shadows, your position has been compromised. You might be able to bluff your way out, engage in combat, or attempt another approach. How would you like to proceed? I would like to emerge from the shadows and say, Oh hey there, how's it going? I've been sent here as a guard relief. Your shift was cut early. And I got a 10 on my performance check. Stepping forward, you adopt a casual demeanor doing your best to seem nonchalant and unthreatening, trying to inject a sense of authenticity into your voice. The elven figure narrows his eyes, his gaze flicking between you and the other guards. Guard relief. We weren't informed of any changes, he says, clearly skeptical. Another guard, a burly orc with a scar running across his face, grumbles. Let it be just like them, wouldn't it? Sending someone without telling us. However, a third guard, a tiefling with a series of intricate tattoos snaking up her arm, interjects. I've never seen him around here before. And why would they send just one for relief? Your performance wasn't entirely convincing, and while you've sown a seed of doubt, they're still wary of you. Would you like to further the bluff, prepare for potential combat, or take a different approach? Well, they didn't send just me, and I would like to now summon Simon and Jaylee. I also have a few other summons I can bring out, and some other skills. I would now like to shoot Eldritch Blast into the swamp behind me to emphasize my battle capabilities. They figured it would be cheaper to hire just me than all of you. And I got a 10 on this performance check. With a confident gesture, you summon Simon and Jaylee. The two shadowy figures materialize by your side, their very presence emanating an air of menace. 
Well, they didn't send just me, you emphasize. Without hesitation, you conjure an Eldritch Blast, letting the powerful energy coalesce in your hand before releasing it into the swamp behind you. The blast rips through the air, illuminating the surroundings briefly before colliding with the swampy terrain, leaving a sizzling crater in its wake. They figured it would be cheaper to hire just me than all of you, you say, trying to exert your dominance in the situation. The guards exchange glances, seemingly weighing their options. The elven figure appears uneasy, the orc is intrigued, but it's the tiefling that responds, her voice dripping with skepticism. That's a nifty trick, but how do we know you're not here to cause trouble? Your performance has certainly drawn their attention, but you're still on thin ice. Would you like to further press the matter, offer a compromise or change tactics entirely? I turn my attention to the other tiefling and say, Hey, I think you guys are getting the raw end of the deal here, honestly. I heard rumors that they're planning on mass staff cutoffs. I mean... Did you hear that Bob was already fired? Man, it sucks when someone who's worked their whole life doesn't even get to enjoy your retirement. Being set on fire is a rough way to go. And I drop my head like I'm in mourning for Bob. Oh, come on, Dice. That sucks as well. <sighs> I got a 13 on this performance check. You shift your gaze to the tiefling, your expression one of empathy and sorrow. The mention of Bob and his supposed fiery demise appears to resonate with the guards. The orc mutters, Damn shame. Bob always shared his rations. The tiefling's previously hard expression softens ever so slightly. I... I hadn't heard about Bob. But if they're planning on mass cuts, maybe it's time to think about my own security. She exchanges a worried glance with the elven guard, who nods in agreement. Look, the elf says cautiously. If you're really here for relief duty, then we'll be on our way. But if we find out you've lied to us, you'll have more than just the temple's guardians to worry about. Your performance seems to have convinced them to a certain degree. The guards appear ready to back off and allow you passage. I look at the group, take out 50 gold pieces and hand it to the tiefling in a conspiratorial manner, lean in and say, Look, you didn't hear any of this from me, alright? They are planning on firing everyone here when you return. They don't want any secrets of this place getting out. But do one guard a solid. I'm sure this place has some secret passages or the like. Where are they? I've been done in by a rogue using secret passage before, and I do not intend on losing another artifact the same way. The tiefling's eyes widen at the sight of the gold, glinting softly in the dim light. She hesitates for a moment, then discreetly takes the coins, palming them with practiced ease. Leaning closer to you, she whispers. I knew there was something fishy going on, but this... This is treachery on another level. She glances around warily before continuing. All right, I'll help you out. There's a secret passageway on the west side of the temple, hidden behind a loose stone. Push it, and the wall will slide open. It leads to the inner sanctum. But be careful, I've heard rumors of traps inside. She leans back, her face hardening. If this is true, and they're planning to betray us, let's just say they'll regret it. Thanks for the heads up, we'll make our own way from here. With that, she nods at her companions, and the trio begin to retreat from the temple entrance, leaving you to your quest. I'll wait until the trio are out of sight, then I want to go to the secret passageway, open it, and use my staff to check what's inside. Waiting for a few moments, you ensure that the trio has disappeared into the depths of the swampy surroundings, their figures gradually fading into the mists, you then move to the west side of the temple, running your fingers over the cold, ancient stone. Soon, you find the loose stone the tiefling mentioned. With a firm push, you hear a grinding noise as a portion of the wall slides away, revealing a narrow, dark passageway. Gripping the Staff of Echoes, you channel your energy and send out a pulse to detect any dangers ahead. The staff vibrates gently, and you receive impressions. There's a section of the floor about ten feet into the passage that gives off an odd resonance, possibly indicating a pit or trap. Further down, you sense a faint, rhythmic vibration, possibly a mechanism of some kind, maybe a pendulum or some other moving trap. Near the end of the corridor, before it opens into a larger chamber, there seems to be another odd resonance in the walls. Maybe concealed dart launchers. The secret passageway is clearly not devoid of danger. Would you like to proceed with caution, employ a specific tactic to navigate, or consider another course of action? I think to myself, well, shit, this place is a death trap. I'd hate to see what the main pathways are like. And I would like to investigate the ground before the first trap, looking for any kind of trigger mechanism. I got nine on my investigation check. Muttering to yourself about the dangers of the temple, you carefully approach the section of the floor that seemed off based on the staff's resonance. Kneeling down, you search for any indication of a trigger or mechanism that might activate the trap. With your roll of nine, you spot some faint scratch marks on the ground, suggesting that something has moved across it previously. However, you can't quite discern any specific trigger mechanism or a safe path to tread. You're left with the knowledge that this section of the floor is likely trapped, but the specifics elude you. Would you like to attempt to bypass it using another method, employ a different tactic, or reconsider your approach entirely? How wide is this secret passage, and how high is the ceiling? The secret passageway is narrow, approximately five feet wide. The ceiling is roughly eight feet high. The stone walls and ceiling are lined with intricate but weathered carvings, indicative of the temple's age and history. The dim light filtering in from the entrance casts eerie shadows, making the passage feel even more confining. Given its dimensions, there's not a lot of room for wide maneuvers, but you might be able to employ vertical tactics or use the walls in some way. What would you like to do next? 
I would like to try and prop myself up on the walls, hands on one side, feet on the other, and shimmy my way past this trap. What kind of role will that be? To prop yourself up between the walls and shimmy past the trap, you'd be performing a maneuver that requires a combination of strength and agility. This action would be best represented by an acrobatics check to see if you can maintain your balance and effectively move past the suspected trap without triggering it. Please go ahead and roll an acrobatics check to see how you fare. All right, I rolled a 10 plus one for my acrobatics. So 11 acrobatic points to pass this trap. With an 11 on your acrobatics check, you manage to press your hands and feet against the walls, pushing off with enough force to prop yourself up. You start to shimmy over the suspicious section of the floor. The maneuver is not without its challenges. The stone walls are rough and there are moments where you feel your grip might slip. However, as you make your way across, you hear a faint click from below. Although you didn't touch the floor, it seems that the pressure difference or a small piece of debris may have set off the trap. A hidden panel swings open, revealing a deep pit filled with sharp spikes. You just manage to keep yourself aloft and clear the opening, but the scare causes you to move with renewed urgency. Reaching the other side of the trap, you let out a sigh of relief and safely drop to the ground past the pit trap. Ahead of you lies the section of the corridor where the staff detected a possible moving mechanism. I would like to investigate the area to see if I can spot what the mechanism is. I want to also see if I can tell the path it will be moving through to see if I can avoid it easily. That's a 14 on my investigation check. With a heightened sense of caution, you approach the next section of the corridor. You begin inspecting the area meticulously. As you move forward, you notice faint, regular grooves in the stone floor, suggesting the path of a swinging pendulum-like mechanism. Booking up, you spot a concealed slot in the ceiling from which the pendulum would likely emerge. The grooves on the floor suggest that the pendulum might swing side to side across the passage, rather than lengthwise. To the sides, just beyond the grooves, there's a narrow section of the floor that seems untouched. This might be a safe area to step on, while the pendulum swings across the main path. You also spot a mechanism on the far wall, possibly a manual trigger or a reset mechanism for the trap. With this information you could try to time your movement to avoid the swinging pendulum, or you could look for a way to disable or bypass the trap entirely. How would you like to proceed? Hmm. I summon Jaylee and I ask her to run to the other side and disable the triggering mechanism. Knowing that she will only be unsummoned if she gets hurt, I know it's safer than sending myself in. Jaylee, one of your shadowy summons, materializes beside you. As a creature of shadow and darkness, her form seems almost ethereal. Understanding your intent, she gives a nod of acknowledgement. She takes off with an uncanny swiftness, making her way toward the far wall. As she approaches the suspected area of the pendulum trap, there's a loud whoosh as a massive, blade-edged pendulum swings down from its concealed slot in the ceiling. It sweeps across the corridor in a wide arc. Jaylee, being a creature of shadows, tries to dart and weave to avoid it. But the pendulum's speed is unexpected. While she manages to avoid a direct hit, the edge of the pendulum grazes her, causing her form to waver and destabilize momentarily. Still, Jaylee pushes on, reaches the mechanism on the far wall, and swiftly tampers with it. You hear a click and the grinding of gears coming to a halt. The pendulum, after a couple more swings, starts to slow its momentum until it eventually hangs still. Jaylee gives you a thumbs up, her form slightly less stable than before but still present. The path ahead now seems free of the pendulum's threat. I walk over to Jaylee, give her a little scritcher scratch behind the ears, and channel some mana through the Amulet of Shadowbinding to restore her back to full power. Then, I would like to assess the next trap. I got an 18 on this investigation check. You approach Jaylee, placing a hand gently on her shadowy form. As you scratch behind what appears to be her ear, a soft purring sound resonates from her, an oddly comforting sound given her ethereal nature. Channeling mana through the amulet of shadow binding, you can feel the energy flowing into Jaylee, stabilizing and reinforcing her form, the previously wavered parts of her now appear solid and full of strength. With Jaylee revitalized, you turn your attention to the next section of the corridor, armed with your impressive 18 investigation check, you are exceptionally observant. The next stretch of the corridor seems to be layered with thin, almost translucent tripwires, these wires are set at varying heights, making simple ducking or hopping insufficient. Each wire is connected to a small mechanism on the wall, which likely triggers some form of danger. With your keen eye, you also spot a pattern. Every third wire seems to be a decoy, not attached to any mechanism. This pattern might provide an opening to navigate through if you're careful. Given the number of wires and their placement, it will be a challenge to pass without triggering them. But their observation has given you a possible path through the maze of trip wires. How would you like to proceed? Ooh. All right, I would like to try and make my way through the passage, avoiding all the tripwires. I pay particular attention to my horns and tail to make sure that they don't accidentally set anything off. I also unsummon Jaylee and whisper a message. Good job, buddy, but I got this one. Oh, Biss, yeah, I rolled a natural 20 on my acrobatics check. With Jaylee unsummoned and your full concentration on the task at hand, you begin your careful navigation through the web of tripwires. A natural 20 on your acrobatics check ensures that you are at your peak performance, moving with grace and precision. Every step is calculated, 
you duck under one wire, then sidestep another, sometimes even performing an elegant pirouette to clear multiple wires in a single motion. Your heightened awareness makes you hyper-conscious of every part of your body, ensuring that your horns, tail, and even the tips of your cloak don't come into contact with any of the wires. The few moments it takes to clear the maze feels like an eternity, but eventually, you emerge on the other side without triggering a single wire. It's an impressive display of agility and control, one that few could accomplish. Ahead of you, the corridor seems to widen into a larger chamber. The glow of what seems like torchlight spills into the corridor from the chamber beyond. This might be where the heart of the abyss is kept. What would you like to do? I would like to use the staff to check the room for any dangers, because this thing is way <laughs> too helpful to not abuse. You raise the Staff of Echoes, focusing on its power to detect unseen threats. As you channel energy through it, the staff emits a soft, pulsating light. Your senses expand outward, flowing into the chamber ahead. You feel the contours of the room, the positioning of objects, and any magical or physical threats. The room is a large circular chamber with a high domed ceiling. In the center of the chamber, elevated on a stone platform, is an ornate pedestal. On the pedestal, enveloped by a shimmering magical barrier, rests a pulsating dark object. The heart of the abyss. The barrier itself radiates a powerful aura, suggesting that any direct interaction without the proper knowledge or tools would be dangerous. Around the perimeter of the room are four statues, each depicting a hooded figure with its hands outstretched. The statues appear to be channeling energy toward the barrier surrounding the heart. They could be a part of the mechanism that maintains the barrier. There is no other visible threat, but the magical aura emanating from the barrier is strong, and it suggests that the heart won't be easily accessed. I would like to inspect the statues to see if there is any writing or hints about how I turn off the barrier. Approaching the statues, you take a closer look at each one, seeking any inscriptions or hints that might provide clues on how to deactivate the barrier. Upon closer examination, you find that each statue bears a distinct marking on its base. The first statue depicts a sun rising over a mountain peak. The second has a crescent moon cradled in the crook of a willow tree. The third shows a star surrounded by swirling winds. The fourth features a cloud, from which rain and lightning emerge. Moreover, in the center of the room, near the pedestal holding the heart of the abyss, there's a circular engraving on the floor. The engraving seems to be divided into four quadrants, each representing one of the elements depicted on the statue bases, earth, water, air, and fire. Your intuition tells you that these symbols might be a sequence or a ritual necessary to deactivate the barrier. But figuring out the correct sequence or combination will be essential to prevent triggering any protective countermeasures. Ah, is the passage I came in hidden in this chamber or is it just open on this side? The passage you entered through is indeed concealed on this side, but not entirely. From the chamber's perspective, it appears as a section of the wall with slightly mismatched stones. A keen observer might notice its presence, but for most it would blend seamlessly with the rest of the chamber wall. The concealment is designed for the benefit of those who are familiar with the secret passageway, allowing them to enter and exit discreetly without drawing attention from the chamber's occupants. Alright, I would like to try and match the symbols with the base of the statues. The statue with the sunrise marking, I would like to match with the fire symbol. The statue with the crescent moon marking, I would like to match with the earth symbol. The statue with the star surrounded by the winds, I would like to match with the air symbol. And the last statue with the cloud markings, I would like to match with the water symbol. When I match the last one, I would like to dash to the secret passage entry in case something goes wrong or people come into the chamber to investigate. Moving with determination, you approach each statue in turn, carefully aligning the symbols on their bases with the corresponding quadrants on the floor engraving. As you align the last statue with the water symbol, the chamber is filled with a low, humming vibration. The barrier enveloping the heart of the abyss begins to fluctuate, its shimmering facade flickering and waning. For a moment, the entire room is bathed in a dim light emanating from the heart itself. Then, as quickly as it began, the barrier drops completely, leaving the heart exposed and vulnerable on its pedestal. But as the barrier drops, the chamber's entrance door on the opposite side begins to slowly creak open, Sensing potential danger, you dash back to the entrance of the secret passage, pressing yourself against the wall in the shadows, ready to observe any newcomers or make a hasty escape if necessary. A group of robe figures slowly enters the chamber, their faces concealed by hooded cloaks. They appear surprised and immediately begin scanning the room, discussing among themselves in hushed tones. How many are in this group? You carefully count the robe figures as they move about the chamber, and there are five of them in total. They spread out in a semi-organized manner, examining the statues and the now exposed heart of the abyss. Their movements and conversation hint at a mix of caution, intrigue, and concern. It's clear that the sudden deactivation of the barrier was unexpected and has caught them off guard. As they discuss among themselves, you notice that one of the figures, slightly taller than the others and adorned with more intricate embroidery on the rope, seems to be leading the group. This individual frequently directs the others, pointing out various elements of the chamber and making quick decisions. Well, I'm not super confident that I can take out five people in a straight-up fight, so I would like to use the Amulet of Mind Control to make the leader say, Yep, everything seems fine here. It must be a solstice. We all know the barrier stops working during those. Back to your posts, everybody. And then have him leave the room confidently. 
Channeling your power through the amulet of mind control, you reach out and touch the mind of the apparent leader. There's a brief moment of resistance. This individual has a strong will, but the amulet's magic is potent. You manage to implant the thought and words you desire into his mind. The leader suddenly straightens, looking around with a calm, assured demeanor. Everything seems fine here. It must be a solstice. We all know the barrier stops working during those. Back to your posts, everyone. The other robed figures look to him with a mix of confusion and relief. But such is the leader's authority that they don't question his statement. With a few nods and murmured agreements, they begin to exit the chamber, following their leader. Soon, the chamber is empty save for you and the heart of the abyss. What would you like to do? I would like to quickly wrap up the heart in a cloth and pick it up, ensuring that I'm not touching it directly yet, and make my escape through the secret passage that I entered in. Swiftly, and with great care you wrap the heart of the abyss in a thick cloth you had stashed in your belongings. You ensure that your hands do not come into direct contact with the artifact. With the heart securely bundled up, you tuck it safely into your pack, feeling the weight and power of the object even through the layers of protection. You then turn to the secret passage from which you entered, and make your way back retracing your steps, and avoiding the traps you had previously navigated. The artifact seems to pulse with dark energy, and you can't shake the feeling that it's observing you in some intangible way. After what feels like an eternity, but in reality is probably only a few tense minutes you emerge from the underground temple and back into the dense, dark, abyssal forest. The way ahead is clear, and you begin your trek back to the Obsidian Covenant's headquarters, artifact in hand, eager to discover its true power and potential. As you move through the forest the looming trees and eerie silences remind you that this journey is far from over, and that possessing the heart of the abyss may bring both untold power and unforeseen consequences. Ooh, thanks for the hand waving me out of all the danger. Now that I'm by myself, I would like to test out the heart to see if I can control it. I want to try something simple to begin with, and use it to create a solid sword made out of shadows that won't completely dissipate in the light. Holding the cloth-wrapped heart of the abyss in front of you, you take a deep breath, mentally preparing yourself. You slowly unwrap the heart revealing its dark, mesmerizing glow. The moment your eyes lock onto the artifact you feel its vast, ominous energy reaching out to you, inviting you to tap into its depths. With a focused intention you channel your will towards the heart imagining a sword made of pure, solid shadow. The heart responds, its dark aura growing even more intense, swirling and concentrating in the space before you. After a few moments a shadowy blade begins to take shape emerging from the very air around you. It's a sword, just as you had envisioned but it's unlike any weapon you've ever seen. The blade is made of pure shadow, and yet it feels tangible and real in your hand. Even in the ambient light of the abyssal forest the sword remains solid and doesn't dissipate. You take a few test swings feeling the weight and balance of the shadowy blade. It's sharp, responsive, and feels perfectly attuned to your will. As you experiment with the sword you can't help but feel a rush of excitement at the potential the heart of the abyss offers. But there's also a lingering sense of unease, a reminder that such power often comes with a price. Ooh, what are the stats on this sword? How much damage does it do? And does it have any inherent abilities or powers? Shadowblade of the Abyss, damage. 1d8 necrotic damage, special abilities, shadow meld. Once per long rest as a bonus action you can become one with the shadows. This gives you advantage on stealth checks for the next minute. Dark Surge. When you score a critical hit with this weapon you can choose to unleash a burst of shadow energy. The target takes an additional 2d6 necrotic damage and must succeed on a dc15 constitution saving throw or be blinded until the end of their next turn. Ephemeral form, the sword can be dismissed or summoned to your hand as a bonus action. When dismissed, it merges with your own shadow. Drawback, the sword is directly linked to the heart of the abyss. If the heart is ever more than 100 feet away from you, the sword will dissipate until you come back into range. While the shadow blade of the abyss is undoubtedly powerful, Wielding it also serves as a constant reminder of the artifact's enigmatic nature. Oh my patron! This thing is amazing! What else can we do? I summon Simon and Jaylee and ask them, Would you like me to try and power you up? At this, I hold up the Heart of the Abyss so they know how I would be trying to give them extra power. Simon and Jaylee, being shadowy constructs, tilt their heads as they regard the Heart of the Abyss. You can sense a strange resonance between them and the Heart. While they lack the emotions and understanding that living beings possess, you feel a keen eagerness emanating from them, a desire to become more potent and connected to this new source of shadowy power. Given your bond you understand this as their form of agreement and curiosity towards the empowerment the heart might provide. I would like to try and make them and the amulet they're connected to more powerful. Do I need to roll anything for this? Empowering your shadowy familiars using the heart of the abyss is a task that involves both willpower and arcane knowledge. This is essentially merging one source of power, the heart, with another, your amulet. Please make an arcana check to understand and manipulate the flow of power from the heart into the amulet, and then into Simon and Jaylee. The result of the roll will determine the extent and nature of their empowerment. Oh heck yeah! I rolled a natural 20 on that one. Give me them sweet power-ups. With a natural 20, your mastery over the heart's power is nothing short of miraculous. As you channel the dark energies from the heart into the amulet, you feel a rush of power unlike anything you've ever experienced. You watch as the amulet pulsates with an even deeper shade of darkness. 
and tendrils of shadowy energy wrap around Simon and Jaylee, the transformation is mesmerizing. Simon grows in stature, becoming more muscular and defined, his form solidifies, looking less ethereal and more tangible. Glowing, violet cat-like eyes appear on his face, giving him a semblance of life and sentience. He now has the ability to use a shadow swipe attack, which, upon hitting an enemy, has a chance to weaken their defenses, reducing their AC by 2, for a turn. Additionally, his hit points increase by 50%. Jaylee, always more lithe and agile, sprouts ethereal wings made of pure shadow. She gains the ability to fly, and her speed increases considerably. With her new agility, she gains a whirlwind strike which allows her to hit up to three enemies in a single round, albeit with slightly reduced damage for each successive strike. Her hit points also increase by 50%. Both familiars now have an innate shadow meld ability, giving them the power to become completely invisible in shadows or darkness for a short duration once per day. The power you've channeled into them remains, and the bond between you and your familiars feels stronger than ever. They seem more responsive, more alive, and more connected to your will. Wow! That's more amazing than I thought it would be, I say to both summons. How do you feel? Simon, though still a being of mostly silence, looks at you with his new violet eyes. There's a depth of understanding and gratitude there. He gives a nod, signifying his newfound strength and approval of the power boost. Jaylee, on the other hand, flits around joyfully with her new shadowy wings, doing loops in the air before settling back down next to you. The vibrant, playful energy she emits seems to say, I feel great. Both familiars seem to resonate with a newfound vigor, confidence, and deeper connection to you. They're ready to face whatever challenges lie ahead with their enhanced abilities. I would like to try and grow my own powers with the Heart of the Abyss. I'm going to try and alter my body's natural mana flows to align more with the shadows. I assume I'll need to make another Arcana check, and I rolled a 15 with my bonuses. As you concentrate on the Heart of the Abyss, seeking to further align your own natural mana flows with the essence of shadows, you feel a cold yet invigorating energy creeping into your veins. The world around you seems to dim for a moment, and your vision is filled with swirling shades of purple and black. The process is intense, but you manage to direct the energy from the heart to augment your connection to the shadow plane. As a result, your affinity with shadow-based magic is enhanced. Personal power boost, shadow step. Once per short rest, you can step from one shadow to another. As a bonus action, you can teleport up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space. You can see that is also in dim light or darkness. Eyes of the abyss. Your vision in darkness, both magical and non-magical, is improved to 120 feet. Dark resilience. You gain resistance to necrotic damage. The integration is not without its challenges. As the energy settles, you feel a weight on your mind and soul. Harnessing such power requires a balance, and you recognize the importance of not letting the heart's influence consume you entirely. Feeling the new strength in your being, you understand that while this artifact has given you impressive powers, it's a tool that demands respect and caution. <sighs> to the abyss with respect of great power, I say to myself, and use the heart to give myself some shadowy wings. I turn to Jaylee and say, how about a race? First one on top of that hill and back wins. I think that this should be a fair race since Jaylee's upgraded shadow summon form also has wings. Jaylee, with her newly acquired shadowy wings, seems to understand your challenge. She playfully chirps, her eyes filled with excitement, and spreads her wings wide, showing off their impressive span. The wings seem to absorb the surrounding light, leaving behind a surreal darkness. As you generate your own shadow wings, you feel a surge of power and exhilaration. The wings are large, bat-like, and composed of the same swirling shadows as the heart of the abyss. They feel weightless but powerful, and the sensation of having them is unlike anything you've ever felt before. On your mark, both of you launch into the air. Jaylee's agility and newly enhanced speed are evident, but your shadow wings also grant you impressive velocity and maneuverability. The world below becomes a blur, as both of you race towards the lone tree on the hilltop. This is more than just a race. It's a moment of liberation, a testament to the power you now hold, and the bond you share with your shadow companions. Roll a d20 for your racing skill, and let's see who reaches the top first. I don't have a racing skill, but I do have an acrobatic skill, and that seems like it would work. I rolled a 12. Using your acrobatic skill to navigate and maneuver with your newly formed shadow wings, you manage to gain a decent speed and stay somewhat competitive with Jaylee. The race is close. Jaylee's upgraded form makes her a formidable opponent in the air. She swoops, dives, and gracefully arcs through the sky, making use of every ounce of her newfound power. You both reach the lone tree almost simultaneously, with Jaylee landing just a split second before you, she chirps triumphantly and playfully nudges you, clearly pleased with her victory. But this time, with a better understanding of how to use your wings, you manage to land just a fraction of a second before Jaylee making it a tie overall. Both of you panting slightly from the excitement, it's clear that the experience has been a thrilling one, not just because of the race, but because of the display of newfound powers and the bond that has deepened between you both. Well, this thing is certainly useful. I say, thinking up even more possibilities for how the heart could be used. Wanting to reward both familiars for being awesome little evil creatures of chaos, I use the heart again to create a treat for them in the form of solid shadow mana. For Jaylee, I make what looks like a bone, and for Simon, I make what looks like a protein bar. Both Jaylee and Simon look curiously at the treats you've crafted for them from the shadows. The treats shimmer slightly, as if holding condensed raw energy within. Jaylee hesitates for a moment, eyeing the bone cautiously, then chirps happily, and starts nibbling on it. 
The shadow energy is absorbed into her, and you can see her feathers glow faintly with a dark energy for a moment before returning to normal. It's clear that she enjoys it and appreciates the gesture. Simon on the other hand sniffs the protein bar-shaped treat, then takes a small bite. He seems content as he munches the treat, giving him a bit of a power boost. The soft, ambient glow from his ethereal form brightens slightly as he consumes the treat. The familiar's reactions and the heart's versatile capabilities reaffirm your belief in the immense potential of the heart of the abyss. With it the limits of what you can accomplish seem boundless, opening up numerous avenues for creativity and power. With the heart being so versatile and powerful, and already having changed myself for the better, I would like to try and attune the heart to myself and myself to the heart, forever linking and binding us together. My aim is to make it impossible for anyone else to use the heart of the abyss. That's a 17 on my arcana check, which is pretty damn good if you ask me. Clearly, I know a lot about this heart and how it works, but there is still some mystery in this relationship. With your deep understanding of arcane energies and the mysterious properties of the heart of the abyss, you decide to initiate a binding ritual. This intricate process aims to forge an unbreakable bond between the heart and yourself, ensuring no one else can harness its powers. As you begin, shadows swirl around you, enveloping you in a cocoon of darkness. The ambient energy in the environment seems to resonate with the heart's frequency, the very air pulsing with shadowy power. You can feel the heart and its power drawing closer to your own essence, intertwining with your life force. In this dance of energies, memories, feelings, and intentions blend. There are moments of intense emotion, flashes of your past, and glimpses into the heart's ancient existence. It feels as though you're becoming one with an entity much older and more mysterious than you'd initially realized. The process is intense, challenging, and demands every ounce of your concentration. When the ritual finally concludes you emerge changed, the heart of the abyss is now irrevocably tied to you, its power accessible only by your will. You feel its presence within you, like a second heartbeat, but one that beats with shadowy might the shadows dissipate, revealing the heart has merged with you. Where it once was a tangible object, it's now an emblematic mark on your chest, a black heart-shaped sigil. The intricate designs shimmer when you focus on it, and you can feel the heart's boundless potential just beneath the surface of your consciousness. With this connection, not only is the heart's power secure from others, but your own magical abilities have grown exponentially. You're now a force to be reckoned with bearing one of the most potent artifacts in existence. However, with great power comes great responsibility. The choices you make from here on out carry even more weight and consequences. What am I, Spider-Man? <sighs> has this binding increased any of my in-game characteristics or has it just opened up the potential of more shadow magic? The binding of the Heart of the Abyss to yourself has resulted in both an enhancement to your in-game characteristics and opened up further avenues for shadow magic exploration. Here are the specifics. Stat enhancements. Constitution plus two. The binding of such a powerful artifact has fortified your body, making you more resilient to physical and magical harm. Charisma plus two. The heart's inherent pull of mysterious allure has intensified your own presence, making you more influential in social interactions. Shadow affinity. You gain advantage on arcana checks related specifically to shadow magic or anything related to the abyss. New abilities. Shadow step. Once per short rest, you can step from one shadow into another within 60 feet. As a bonus action on your turn, you can teleport along with any equipment you are wearing or carrying. Abyssal ward. You can as a reaction absorb a portion of incoming magical damage, half damage from spells for one turn. This ability can be used once per long rest. Summon Abyssal Minion. Once per long rest, you can summon a shadowy creature from the Abyss to aid you in battle for 10 minutes. This creature is equivalent to a CR1 monster with shadow-related abilities. Potential for shadow magic exploration. With the heart of the Abyss now bound to you, there's an entire spectrum of shadow magic that is waiting for your discovery. However, always remember that while the heart of the Abyss grants great power, it also has a deep and mysterious past. There might be consequences or challenges that arise from wielding such a potent artifact, ensuring your adventures remain intriguing and unpredictable. Alrighty, with myself and my summons all charged up, I would like to return to the Obsidian Covenant. When I get to the entrance, I would like to unsummon Simon and Jaylee, since their altered forms would give away my success immediately. I would then like to walk into the main chamber and say, Hey everyone, it's me, your favourite tiefling! And I would like to try and high-five the council member that gave me the mission to retrieve the heart. As you confidently stride into the main chamber of the Obsidian Covenant, your declaration draws the attention of everyone present. Their expressions, a mix of curiosity and anticipation, center on you. The council member who had tasked you with retrieving the heart of the abyss slowly rises from his seat, his dark robes rustling softly. At your attempt to high-five a hint of a smirk forms on the council member's lips, while the air is thick with anticipation, and many would expect him to maintain his stern and aloof demeanor, he surprises the assembly by reciprocating the gesture, albeit a bit awkwardly. There's a muted collective gasp from the onlookers, with the tension momentarily broken the council member then intones. Very well, you have our attention. Present what you have retrieved. Uh, I can't really present it as such. Uh, at this I would like to pull out the Shadow Blade of the Abyss and say, But, I think the results speak for themselves. I was able to use the heart effectively, so as per our agreement, it's mine. 
The chamber goes silent for a moment, as all eyes fixate on the shadow blade you wield. The weapon's very essence seems to ripple and flow with the darkness of the abyss, reflecting your mastery over the heart's power. The council member looks at the blade, and then back at you. His gaze sharp but not hostile. Indeed you have demonstrated a proficiency that few can claim. The heart of the abyss is one of our order's most coveted artifacts, and its power is unmatched. You have earned the right to wield it but remember the responsibility that comes with such might. A murmur of agreement flows through the gathered members, though there are a few skeptical glances. Clearly some are impressed by your success, while others seem wary or even envious. The council member continues. The Obsidian Covenant recognizes your accomplishment and your newfound bond with the heart. Use it wisely for, while it can bring great power, it also has the potential for great devastation. With that said, he gives you a nod of respect. Welcome back, and be wary of those who might seek to control or take the heart from you. Its allure is not lost on others. Ah, come on Tim, lighten up. I say giving him a random nickname. Smirking at his response to the nickname, I continue, Well, you see, Tim, you still haven't given me a name to call you by, so I've made one up. Tim the Mighty, Tim the Fearsome, Tim the Tool Man! I exclaim the last one with much vigor and raise one of his hands high into the air as though in triumph. The council member now dubbed Tim by you, raises an eyebrow, and seems momentarily taken aback by your audacity. The room fills with a tense silence as everyone waits for his reaction. After a pregnant pause, a small smile tugs at the corner of his mouth, and he lets out a chuckle. Tim, the tool man, is it? I've been called many things in my time, but never that. He pulls his hand free from your triumphant hold, and continues. You have a unique way of lightening the mood, tiefling. But remember, there's a time for jokes, and a time for seriousness. He looks around the chamber. Let it be known that Tim approves of this name. For now. There's a ripple of laughter and murmurs throughout the chamber. Some members of the Covenant share amused glances while others roll their eyes. Whatever tension was there seems to have been broken, at least for the moment. I slap him heartily on the back and say, You're alright, Tim. And I would like to gauge everyone's reaction in the room, noting anyone who has a particularly negative response. I got an 8 on my investigation check. With an 8 on your investigation check, you quickly scan the room to gauge reactions. The various members of the Obsidian Covenant seem to have a mix of responses. Most of the members appear mildly amused or indifferent, chuckling lightly or shaking their heads at the antics. However, due to your modest role, you're unable to pick out any particularly strong negative reactions. There are one or two members whose faces are more inscrutable, and it's hard to discern whether they are simply keeping their emotions in check or genuinely displeased. You're left with a general sense that, while many in the room appreciate the levity, there are likely those who would prefer a more serious or respectful tone. But without a clearer read, it's hard to say for certain who might be on your side or against you. That's alright. I have a secondary plan for drawing out any potential threats in this covenant. It wouldn't be an evil covenant without some form of internal politics that threaten the lives after all. I would like to go to the bar that I assume we have in this secret cave. I enjoyed the AI generated pictures even though it struggled a bit with what I was giving it this time, and here are my favourite failed attempts. Oh, and as much as it tempts me, I'm going to try and avoid keeping any more of these overpowered artifacts that ChatGPT keeps giving me. I want to try and keep our campaign a bit challenging and fun, and to try and prevent ChatGPT from just getting carried away, I have a plan using just what we have, but I'm not going to tell you what that is. I also want to give a huge shout out to everyone who sent in pictures based on the last video's challenges. I genuinely enjoyed adding your creations to our story, and to be honest, I wasn't really expecting any responses at all considering I had like two people that watched my videos, so seeing everyone engage and be enthusiastic about it was actually a very delightful surprise. Anyway, keep weaving your own incredible stories both in and out of the game world, and goodbye, goodbye from, from the, the past! past. Ooh.